guys, so this is part two of the Lakeshore exterior wall framing, and we're gonna get into interior walls for part one, click above. Basically, as you saw at the end of the last video, we had all of our exterior walls up and we showed some of the rake walls being built off on one part of the floor and then brought in. Now we're showing the biggest part of the wall. So let me just go right to the layout. Now normally when I frame a rake wall, I frame it from outside to outside. In this case, I decided to frame it five and a half short because the wall that intersects this, we had already framed standard height and went and set it off to the side. Essentially what we like to do is build walls where we have room, go move them, then build the biggest wall, lift it, and then the other walls are ready to drop into place, and that just kind of shortens some of the bracing. So five and a half inches short, then I use 16 foot material because it tends to be a little straighter, it's never perfect, that's okay. Now because all of my layout starts from an outside corner, I just throw a block there, and I'm using this little Milwaukee 100 foot tape that I bought at Home Depot and I stretch it out because that's gonna tell me the total length of the wall. Right, it's also seven. gonna show me where the studs go, but I always lay out studs last. The reason for that is it drives me nuts when I lay out windows and I already have marks. So windows get laid out first. Now, make sure that on these big walls, you get the oh, window centered really or whatever your layout is lay correctly. I know some guys, me that have done that wrong and it's a hassle to fix and the reason is is because we're building generally double king studs and we're nailing the crap out of them <laughs> for the lift itself you know we're building okay, these walls to be structurally like right when they're in place three, right? but secondary okay. to that is we build them a little stronger than they need to for the lift itself so even though i've already checked center i did the math with the calculator now that i've got my trimmers essentially marked i double check those that make sure that it's centered in the room I do this often enough, I, or I should say I make a mistake often enough that I just double check everything a few times. Probably. Just as an FYI, that giant glue lamb will be this header. So I'm actually gonna double the trimmers. Wait, what am I doing wrong here? There we go. I'm getting there. Okay, so earlier I showed the 100 foot tape. That just showed where layout was. Once I get one layout, then I just use this big foot layout stick that we've had since like 2005. It's a little bit bent, but it always works. You can see it in previous videos. It's cheap. It's just, I think, 30 bucks. I don't know, I haven't bought one in 15 years. So, you notice though that we are framing 24 inches on center. That is deliberate. We are using the optimum value engineered. Uh, maybe I'll try to put a, a link in the description. Basically, it's trying to minimize unnecessary wood in a wall. And so we frame two foot on center. Just so make sure that your studs are straight. We can do, Kyle. Yeah. I could hold this guy also back five and a half. So like that one down there, you're gonna cut the stud taller. Correct, right, you got the number already. But we could do the same thing here. And I could go, Yeah. I could go, this would be the end of our wall. You know, sometimes, I know we've had to cut these out before, it's kind of a hassle. But this time we have an LVL shooting across instead of a beam because Terry engineered it. 
So if that caps this end stud. So to sit on the flat wall and like, yeah. and like nail in. We would be flat from here to here. Right. Which I, I think I could cut plates now, but we might just cut them after the fact. Whatever, Whatever we want to do. There's, there's really no studs. It would be a six by six. It doesn't need to be a six by six. It's just studs, like a double stud. Yeah, because it's just carrying a single ply of EO. So I'm five and a half short to the short of the stud. Correct. This line is the five and a half short to the short. So your studs would be the same. And then your top plates also, instead of 42 foot, one half, they would be minus 11 divided by two. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that way they come right to the edge. We can square it. Right. Then this is going to go up. The other wall will cap it. This wall will come in. This wall will cap it. Okay. So this is this would be a regular stud. That would be your. Now this is going to be the minus five and a half. Correct. So this will be. That's so short. this will be the same as the other one. Yes. Down there. Okay. So one sixteen is love, and eleven is my number. And I'll do this to make that a little more obvious. Okay. But I when we actually frame. We'll add stud, stud, stud. Correct. Okay, is that clear as mud? No, <laughs> hopefully not. Essentially, each end of the rake wall, instead of being an outside of building to outside of building, it's going to butt those walls. And that's why it's five and a half short on each side. That made it a little simpler to frame the wall because the top plates are identical. Those end studs, it's easy to do the math, make them identical. Now Kyle and Shane can essentially snap out the wall because they're longer than our plate material. Nice straight line. They tack that to the wall, nice and straight. I mean, think about that. Our trusses aren't perfect, our rafters aren't perfect, but we can make the top plates of this wall basically perfect, or perfect-er. <laughs> Let's make that the new term. They're perfect-er than the rafters that we would have used instead of the wall because they're framed to the snap line. What Kyle and Shane are doing is they're laying out the underside of those top plates to directly align with my layout on the bottom plates. So we always start with the king studs. Same thing as layout, we wanna start with the windows first. Then after that, we usually find a stud that's about mid, mid height. Once that one's marked, you see that's what Shane and Kyle are doing right now, is they use the math on the calculator and they lay out their studs. What we find with that is that your studs end up, if you can trust the math and we do that all the time. In this case, it's just to give Shane some practice and get him used to the repetition. But we could find that center stud, calculate the stud height difference, subtract and add, and then one guy can just do it on the list. But in this case, it's on. What we, here's the thing. You can do this the fastest way possible, or because you're saving so much time building a big wall, you can slow down just a little bit to make sure that you don't goof it up. So that's kind of like, then the whole time that you're kind of maybe duplicating a step, it's a way to kind of check yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. You knew that was coming. While they're doing that, I went ahead and started cutting off of a different pile, uh, trimmer heights, sills, cripple studs, and I think I even started to cut headers. And because the windows are kind of the slowest part, that's always where we start. Uh, they often get double king studs and we oppose the crowns and that way that as you oppose the crowns, you straighten out both boards, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I didn't get the rest of the time lapse. I apologize for that. I thought I got a sheeting. Anyway, uh, here's, so now we're doing the overhang for that wall. For us, we always go with the two by six nailed to the wall. Then we go with little cripple studs, haphazardly nailed, it doesn't matter, but we shoot for like four to six foot on center. You're gonna see why in just a minute. It doesn't matter. And then two by six top plates. Once all of that's done and the wall is sided, then we brace those square to the wall. Those braces stay in until the roof is sheeted and generally until we get back up on the wall to side if we need to side. Otherwise, we just get on a ladder, pop up there and pull them off. After we've sheeted, after the roofers have been up there and those overhangs are rock solid in our climate zone. We use 16 foot lengths of the, I think it's 3 8 or maybe it's 7 16 I think it's 3 8 by 16 foot LP soffit. That's what gives this wall a lot of stiffness. The double top plates, the overhang framing, 
And then when we nail that, it's nailed six inches on center, so it acts like a strong back, stiffens up that wall, keeps it nice and straight. As long as we put a brace here and there for plumb, that wall is perfectly straight. Adding our fly rafters or our trim material is easy. We really like this pass load 16 gauge nailer. That's what we nail all of our exterior trim on. Read the manufacturer's instructions, that is allowed. Okay, that is allowed, but go look it up. If, if I remember when I finally post this video, it, it can be a little hard to find that. Maybe I'll reach out to the rep and put it in the description below. So, overhangs are on the wall. It takes about 20 minutes. Now on this side of the wall, notice on the bottom left, that was the flat spot that Kyle and I were just talking about. Then it goes up a little higher for the heel stand or height above plate on the rafter, and then it rakes. I always cut a little pattern rafter and nail it because that allows me to dial in this overhang. See how easy that works? Idiot proof it, don't do any math. Math has its place, but if you make a mistake with math, it's really a nightmare. Versus, essentially, scribe and cut. So there it is. That little piece of soffit will go on later after the roofers are done. We want to leave a piece of the roof sheathing off so that they have access. You want to be good to the trades that follow you. Scratch their back, they scratch your back. So it's just treat others the way they would like to be treated and the way you would like to be treated. Hey, that's a, that's a novel idea, isn't it? Uh, again, primed the cut ends. You can see the paint there. Shane just nails it all off with the 16 gauge nailer. Now we are ready to install our belly band. That's what we call them. Now here's what's a little different on this house. We had some two and a half inch metal bent. We nail on a bunch of scrap pieces to basically fur out. So the trim that we're putting on is five quarter by eight or five quarter by 10, I don't remember. You can't buy two by material. But what we like to do is put a layer of wood under the trim so that we can tuck our siding. That will become apparent later. If we use up scrap two by, you could also use up layers of scrap, you know, ripped sheeting if you had it, whatever. Now we're two and a half inches from the zip to the face of the outside face of the trim. That gives us an inch and a half to tuck and it looks better for the shadow line. So see there, everything was snapped nice and straight, parallel to the bottom plate. We already know that that's level because we did the concrete work and we've already checked concrete. Now we just shoot across with our trim board. Kyle's shooting across with the um, metal itself. And then one of us is gonna shoot across taping the metal to the zip, and then one guy is gonna roll that tape. It's just an assembly line. See how we all kind of leapfrog each other? Big walls allow you to spread out. You can work together without working right over the top of each other. You get a lot done. Perfectly straight. Now it's time to side the gable, and spoilers, this only took 20 minutes. So Kyle's cutting in place. He's basically keeping track of what we, Shane and I, need as we nail. See how he's staying ahead of us? Shane and I, in the meantime, are gonna go ahead and we're gonna snap top lines all the way across. And that way, it takes like five minutes. That way we're not pulling out our tape measure except to take some random lengths here and there, but it also allows us to line that smart side 16 foot siding and keep it perfectly straight. After that, it's just production. Once we get a little closer to the top, we'll take a bottom mark. Kyle can calculate the differences. He can cut them all. Shane and I will go into like cleanup mode. We'll start caulking what needs to be caulked, staging, etc. So you gain a ton of efficiency building the wall this way. We didn't have windows or we would have set the windows too. So that's always our goal. But with COVID, it has really messed up some of our um, scheduling. But hey, it's a one story house. Not the hardest thing in the world to hang windows later. So, all of the raked pieces get put up against the soffit, but we always cover that joint with what we call shadow fascia, and it's like one by six or one by eight, so your cuts don't have to be perfect. There you go, it's done. Now it's time to lift the wall. I have a separate video here on the channel on how to safely lift this wall, and it gets into all of the rigging and how we go about doing it. Suffice to say for this video, by the way, I was a little constrained by a low voltage power line. So that was about as high as I could go and had to make the rest up with the truss chip. That wall is lifted using brackets that are custom engineered, custom fabricated. We keep those drawings in case the safety police show up. We can show them that. Um, we have shown them those brackets before. 
They are each rated to lift far more than the heaviest wall we've ever lifted. So we're generally lifted for about four times the weight. Now, one thing to know though, is as the wall goes up, as long as it stays on the floor, the forklift will see, so to speak, less weight as the wall goes up. Now, whenever we lift these, Kyle uses the laser to plumb the wall. We use our longest material, two by six, and we use structural screws. The reason for that is they are far stronger than nails. We've had a wall blow off about, what is that, 11 or 12 years ago? Had a microburst come through. I had already gone out, put more braces on the wall. It ripped them all right out. So we use the structural screws and we install those braces where we won't need to frame walls later. You can see we had the front rake wall ready to go. That's why that side rake wall was framed five and a half inches short. So as soon as we're up and braced, we can go grab the other wall, drop in in place, tie them together. That means the end is now braced. And we do the same thing with all the empty space below on the very bottom right of your screen. There's another rake wall ready to go in. And you can also see that we've got that little two foot wall that the sheathing is hanging out five and a half inches to catch the wall that we're gonna set. So I think that all makes sense if you look at it Rewatch that clip a couple times if you don't, but basically there's the process. At this point, it was time for lunch. After lunch, we decided since all the walls were installed, let's go ahead and finish up all of the sheeting from the block line down to the mud cell. Now to do that, we used up scrap, but the quickest way to break down your sheet goods is with a track saw. In this case, I'm using Zip R6. So one inch of poly iso foam with a 7 16 inch panel. So you can see how quickly I roll through those rips. We laid out the block so that all of our rips would be 24 inches or slightly less to get as much out of the sheets as we could. If you don't have this tool, I highly recommend it. I find it to be more efficient. I get perfectly straight cuts, great tool. Now I'm taping the underside of the foam just to keep that foam project protected since it projects in the foundation. Kyle's nailing it off from the block line to the mud sill. Now, what I want to show off here, this is new for us last year. It's a sidewinder carriage that rotates and it has given us so much more maneuverability out of the forklift. You have to watch though how it affects the balance. So you don't want to do it with the load way up in the air. But down low like that, Kyle just brings in all of our two by four plates, drops it into a window, it's out of our way on the inside. Now I can just grab material and go through and start laying out interior walls. I always use 16 foot and then I keep track of the scrap as I go. And you will notice, this might cause some controversy, as they say in the UK sometimes, probably never, just made that up. I cut all of my interior wall plates the same length. I don't overlap and underlap anywhere. The reason I do that yep. is because I'm as I go up the ladder when I frame walls, and you'll see that in a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and strap them. I have to strap them to the exterior wall so my thinking is I'll just do it on the inside and then I can just use my 10 and a quarter inch saw to cut them right over the line, perfectly identical at one time. Now, as I go through and lay out interior walls, I tip one of them down because that doesn't need to be laid out. I always mark my partitions. We took all of the time at wall when we snapped out wall layout to make sure everything was square and parallel. My job now is to make sure that the bottom and top plates are exactly the same as what's on the floor. And then essentially, when I add studs, it's like it extrudes vertically, whatever my wall height is, if that makes any sense. That means that technically, the top of my top plates should be a carbon copy of what's snapped out in the bottom plates. So the way I do that is cut everything in place. I don't really cut anything interior wall-wise off of the plants. I lay it all out in place. I always start with doors. Then I come through and I add for studs. Studs are always last so that they don't confuse me when I'm laying out, <laughs> when I'm laying out doors and windows and things like that. I'm easily confused. So I need to have steps in place to basically not make that an issue. Now line up your layout stick over a seam because we know a seam is gonna be a layout, our joists and studs stack. That's why if all layout pulls from the same wall east-west and from the same wall north-south, nice and easy. I have the job site to myself. So this year, we started to use a tablet for our blueprints. 
which I'm loving. Thank you, Ben Morton, for that suggestion. Uh, it's a Samsung 7, Galaxy 7. Anyway, I like to lay out all three plates, bottom plate, top plate, and double top plate at the same time. You'll kind of see how that works. That's the Bigfoot layout stick that we've had for about 15 years. I mark all of my stud layout with that. 24 on center on this house. I like to lay out plates over the snap lines because we took all the care to make sure those were square and parallel, and so I can't really mess it up if I just do it in place. The 10 and a quarter inch cordless beam cutting saw is perfect for this because I can cut them on edge. Just slightly lift them up or set the depth so you're not scoring the floor, either way. I always cut the plates to center on a stud. I don't think that's actually a code requirement any longer, but old habits. And as I go, the other advantage of the 16 footers is that I can keep track of all of my scrap as I go. The shorty pieces get thrown under the sawhorse. Those will get cut for like a couple blocks or whatever. The other advantage of this is the floor stays clean. I'm not tripping on anything. This is also why I like to do this alone. Now you're probably wondering if I'm cutting all three plates exactly the same length, then how do we connect our walls if there's no overlaps and underlaps? We connect them with straps, I'll get to that later. I find it to be way more efficient to just cut all of my plates at the same time to the same length. We strap all of our exterior walls, or interior walls to the exterior walls anyway because so many of them are balloon frame. This really does speed things up. If you have an apprentice make a mistake one time, he has to get on a ladder and rip that plate off, especially if it's an exterior wall, what's the point? We're using straps to connect our houses, the floors to each other, uh, to hold downs, we, we strap uh, collectors. Basically, we can't build houses without straps anymore because of seismic and hurricane requirements, so why not just extend the principle? So you see now that was my last one. It's just a doorway going into the master bedroom. Take one last look around. Did I miss anything? But the floor's basically clean. Sawhorses are in a decent spot. Kyle's got all the clean stud trimmers made, corners built, so that's it. This isn't the right way. It's not the wrong way. It's just the way I like to do it. One thing I really love about interior wall framing is that everything is pretty lightweight, two by four studs, and pretty idiot proof if we've done the layout right. Now we can just go to work. Generally, while I'm laying out plates, Kyle's cutting king studs and trimmers, nailing them together. He's cutting some door headers and cripples out of the scrap so that by the time I'm done, he's done, and now we can just start framing walls. Uh, we communicate a little bit just to make sure that we don't end up you know, framing over the top of each other. But it's time to just turn up some good music and go to work. And I really like being able to just flip my brain off, listen to music, and go to work. It's kind of funny because on Instagram, a bunch of people were telling me I'm a hack because I have a single two by four as the header. Question, when there is no load above, do I need more than a two by four header? structurally? And the answer is no. There's no reason to put it in structurally, especially when we have uh, hollow core pre-hung doors. Top plates get put on. Remember I had previously nailed them all, but notice on the left, my exterior wall I cut out of a two by six, ripping down to two by four so that it would catch that wall. That's what I measured, stopped my double top plates. Now I can put the wall up, nail it all down to the floor, hop on a ladder. Now it's tied into the exterior wall, which what did that hang in, about six feet? The advantage of that is right where I'm standing is actually a drywall braced wall. And here is the order of operations when I lift the wall. I nail the bottom plates down to the line. I use a laser and I adjust it. See, there's the laser dot. I toe nail it to the block line from our exterior wall. And at the same time, I use the Simpson Strong Tie CSHP strap to tie those walls together. It is designed to be worked with your, with your gun. Now, I never have to get on a ladder again. 
I'm just looking. I'm, lo I'm, I'm looking at the laser. Okay. Just to make sure. Wait. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not awkward at all. So I could do the same thing over here. So what we like to do is brace walls off of brace walls okay. up high so nothing's in the way as we work. Genius, right? That would be better. That is right on the money. Okay. Does that get gapped for a reason? Uh, we got a good quarter strong gap. Oh, I think it moved. Do you have a six inch screw? Yeah. You have an impactor. No. All right, we're gonna fix that gap. <gasps> what? Shane, when he wore the head mount, I watched video and listened to it, and he's talking the whole time. None of it's funny. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know. Nice, good enough. It's, this stud's kind of sticking out. Yeah. No, big deal. Okay. Sweet. So you got that, that's great. Yeah, let me pop this brace. And then I might not have enough nails now. <laughs> I have no hair. Man, look at those skills. Sweet camera skills. Hey Kyle. Okay, how many do I have? I have enough for now. Let me, um. You know what you're doing? Line of placement is. Okay. I think go there. Now I'm out of I don't think we're gonna move this easily unless we really wanted to. No, because it's up against that garage wall too. Right, yeah, so it's not, and it was tight when I peeked out there, so. But we want to connect here? Correct. Okay. You, that's when you're supposed to say. Oh, what, what super view? No, you're supposed to say, you're not stupid. Oh, you're, yeah, you're definitely not. Okay. Hey. Do this. I might be able to push too. I've got a lot of leverage up here. Okay, well, I'm ready to it, so I'll do this. Ow. Right there. No, is it is it perfect enough? Perfect. All right, that was a good day. It's two o'clock. I'm tired. But hey, we got all the walls done and put plumb in line. So all the interior walls are ready. We're plumb in line. So tomorrow we'll start setting beams and then ceiling joists and then maybe ridges and then we're off next week to go camping. But there's something I want to show you guys. This has taken us a long time. I used to work with a guy who said you needed to have so many braces you couldn't walk around. Nein danke, as they say in Germany. Look at how it's braced. So yep, that guy's in the way because it's a big wall. But then what we do is we connect as much across the top as we can to walls that are connected to sheathed walls. So as an example, this wall is connected to a wall that is not going to budge. Then we just push it plumb, tack it. Same thing above me. So the only spring brace we needed was here because that front door wall was just pretty jacked. Those two braces have stayed in place, but almost everything else is above. Now we can walk around without tripping on stuff. Cut out all the door box. Got a place to put our ladders as we're ceiling joisting. Isn't that a lot easier? Oh, also two foot centers is great for walking between. Mm -hmm. 
Nice and clean. Good job, Kyle. Oh yeah. Oh, I gotta get up and get that guy. Now there is a whole lot more to say about wall framing, but I think that gives you kind of an overall view of our approach. On the right hand side, you can see a beam already set on top of the walls. Uh, we went ahead and did that when we lifted some of the walls and there it is. Uh, Kyle started on one end of the house, I started on the other. And the only thing is, is just to keep track of where you're at that you don't frame yourself, you know, paint yourself into a corner, so to speak. So nice and easy. That was a good, nice, beautiful spring day. Notice on the left there in the middle on the sawhorses, that's where Kyle had stacked all of his king stud trimmers so that they were ready. You're trying to make components, right? That way when you're framing, you can just stay in rhythm. All the walls strapped together as we go. And there it is. Not much more to say, but hey, I do have some time to fill. So I should probably say something intelligent. Or just let the music go. Ah, no, here it is on the right hand side. Notice the inspector showed up for our shear inspection. So he and I just chatted. We chatted about some of the issues that we had with the neighbors. Um, he always asks, do we have any questions? So do you think I ever have a question when he asks that? No. <laughs> so I've learned I'm like, okay, inspector's coming out. I need to have a question. There's always something that I, I think, oh, I need to ask the inspector. Write it down and ask them. They are a great resource. It shows them you care, and it's never a bad thing to facilitate some communication. Okay, so there's the braces up high, all the walls are framed, everything's clean. We are ready to start setting some beams and ceiling joists. Now, here's a picture at the start of the day. There's all the walls laid out. Not that many walls, let's be honest. But there they perfectly match what was snapped on the floor, which should perfectly match the plans. Now, if you hear this, there they are in 3D, perfectly matching what you saw before we added steps. So there's the process, square plumb, parallel, level, all that good stuff. Thank you for watching the video, everybody. Please like and subscribe. Tell one other person in your family that you think this is the greatest channel on earth and I will love you forever. Anyway, we're getting into some beams and roof framing in the next video, stay tuned. Thank you again for watching. I'll go check the line. Okay. It's good! Just okay. put the stupid camera down! Screw it! Right there! Right there! I'm creeping! Hold on, hold on, this is awkward. See if it holds. Good job. Booyah! Let's see how I, good it was. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Good job. Thanks. That was a high five. That was good.